Hi there, welcome to Joyce on YouTube. Don't forget to join us on the Joyce Meyer app and at JoyceMeyer.org for more of what you're about to see and lots of great content to help you in your everyday life. Thanks so much for joining us. If, if you want or I want to be what God wants me to be, I might have to put out a little effort. Just praying is not enough to get the job done. I need to study the Word. I need to cooperate with God. I need to pay attention to my spiritual life. If I sin, I need to repent. If I hurt somebody else, I need to go back and apologize. Are you all with me? Okay. So after you're born again, one of the first things you need to do is really understand that God loves you and he's made you right with him. He's made you holy. He has sanctified you. But the Holy Spirit is the agent in sanctification. So it's interesting because if you read this big, long definition in the Vines Dictionary, it says that we are sanctified but being sanctified at the same time. So there's a whole lot of perfect stuff in us but it's being perfected in our lives as we grow. So we have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Now all this good stuff has been done as a gift to us in our spirit. Man, if we could just turn everybody inside out, everybody would be great. <laughs> but God has to work with us to first clean up our soul, and that's all that inner stuff that People don't see, but they see the result of. It's like, you can be mad at me, but still, well, Joyce, we love you with the love of the Lord. <laughs> Whatever in the world that is, I don't know, you know. But I want people to love me truly, not just some kind of phony way. Amen? So, God uses truth to change us. He's not mean to us. Correction is, correction is a blessing. It took me a lot of years to learn that, but I'll tell you now, I actually get excited when God corrects me. You say, well, why in the world would you do that? Because that, that's one of the ways he shows his love. You know, if a parent won't correct a child, you don't love them. If you got a 40-year-old child living in your house that won't work, come on. That, that's not, well, I just love him so much. No, no, I'm sorry, but that's not love. Love said, you're going to grow up, and since you're not doing it here, you're going to have to go find somewhere else to do it. Amen? Now, when God corrects us, he's not mean. He doesn't punish us. He doesn't beat on us. In Psalm 23, the Bible talks about your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Well, you know, people back in the, the day, they took that spare the rod and spoil the child way, way, way out of context. And so when I was a kid or a teenager, you didn't get your cell phone taken away from you. You got slapped across the face <laughs> or you got a belt on your behind. Now, I don't think that's the right way to do it. I don't think that's the way God does it, but he has his ways of correcting us. Let's just say that you're working at a job that requires you to compromise your morals in order to work there and so you like the money you make, and so you do compromise. You won't just get out of there, which is what you should do. Well, God is very capable of causing you to lose that job. Or let's just say that you're hanging out with people that are poisoning your life and dragging you down spiritually, and you know you should get away from them, but you don't. Well, Maybe they'll end up hurting you really, really, really bad 
disappointing you and hurting you and you just think it's the most terrible thing, but actually God has done you a big, big favor. Amen? Well, but that rod and staff, the staff was like a, looked like a cane, only it was made out of a stick and it had a crook on the end of it and when the, if a sheep would fall in a pit or in a hole, the shepherd would gently put that crook around his neck and lift it up out of the pit. And the, the rod was a slender stick. They didn't beat the sheep with it. They would gently, if they got off the path, they would gently nudge them back on to the right path. Now see, that's the way God wants to do us. He's our guide, and he wants to, anytime we're getting off that narrow path, he wants to gently nudge us back on to the right path. Well, what happens in the world today if you fall in a pit? Well, people don't treat you like God does. I got a little story, it's called The Man in the Pit. Very... Years ago, I came across a piece about someone who fell into a pit and couldn't get out. And how other people treated that person. Do you ever fall into a pit? I do sometimes, you know? And sometimes I not only need God's help, I need like some personal help. I need some, I need a hug or I need somebody to, you know, God works through people. He doesn't just work by himself, he works through people. And we all need encouragement. We need our friends to be there when we're hurt. But we, we don't need judgment, we don't need criticism, we don't need to be made to feel guilty. Everybody's already got enough of that. There's times we need to be comforted. So this guy's in a pit. A subjective person came along and said, I feel for you down there in that pit. An objective person came along and said, well, it's logical, somebody's gonna fall in the pit, why not you? <laughs> a Pharisee said, you know, only bad people fall into pits. A mathematician calculated how the individual fell into the pit. A news reported wanted the exclusive story on the person in the pit. A fundamentalist said, you deserve your pit. A Calvinist said, if you'd been really saved, you would have never fallen in that pit. And an Armenian said, you were saved and still fell into the pit. And a charismatic said, oh, just confess you're not in the pit. A realist came along and said, now brother, that's a pit. <laughs> An IRS worker asked if he was paying taxes on his pit. <laughs> Lord have mercy. The county inspector asked if he had a permit to dig the pit. A self-pitying person said, you have not seen anything till you see my pit. An optimist said things could be worse. A pessimist said things will get worse. But Jesus seeing the man simply reached down and took him by the hand and lifted him out of the pit. Come on, God gives praise. So God doesn't treat us the way that people do, thankfully. Now, one of the things that God does, oh, I got so much message and not enough time. John 15, one through three, I'm the vine, my father's the vine dresser. Any branch in me, that's us, you know, that does not bear fruit, uh-oh, here we go, that stops bearing fruit, he cuts away, trims off, or takes away, and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit. So I got this figured out a long time. You're pruned if you do and pruned if you don't, so you might as well go ahead and just try to do things right. And he'll prune us, even if I'm bearing good fruit, God will still deal with me and he'll prune me, he'll keep me trimmed back. In other words, he won't let you get too big for your britches. He'll keep you pruned back so you'll bear richer and more excellent fruit. Now, we used to have a tree in our front yard and it had, and they would grow back, every year we'd have to cut them off, what you call sucker branches. And they're, they're branches that are unsightly. They're in places where they shouldn't be. Like these would come out of the bottom of the tree or some of them would actually be part of the way up the tree. Well, they're, they're not doing any good. The only thing they're doing, now get this, 
is sucking the life out of the tree so the good branches can't bear fruit. Now, do you have any life suckers in your life? <laughs> Come on. Well, because God loves us, he prunes things off of us that are stealing from us and I have this whole set of pruning tools that sometimes I bring when I do any type of message like this, but because of time constraints, I didn't bring them today. But you know, you have everything from little things that look like a pair of scissors to these great big long chopper dudes to saws and everything else. So I want God to get after me when he's just got the little things. You know, I don't want to hang on to my sucker branches until... He's got to get after me with a chainsaw. <laughs> Come on. You, anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, one time when I was at work, Dave had somebody come out and prune that tree, and he pruned it way back. I mean, so I thought, what have you done to that tree? I mean, it was the ugliest thing I had ever seen. But you should have seen that tree the next year. Oh my gosh, it was so beautiful. And see, that's what happens, even if you're talking about real trees, we're trying to get this over into where it's people, but if you prune trees at the right time, and the, the best time to prune them is in the dormant season, and mature trees will handle pruning much better than younger trees, that's why sometimes you'll see a younger believer getting by with things that you know God wouldn't put up with out of you and you don't understand it. Well, it's because a younger believer might, if God starts pruning them too early, they might just give up and quit. Where a more mature person already has a, a dependent relationship on God and they'll put up with that stuff. I had a woman in my office one time that I was counseling and she had just gotten saved just gotten saved. She came to me, she wanted some advice, and in the course of this conversation, she just told me without feeling funny about it at all that she, her and her boyfriend had been living together for a long time. Well, I thought, well, I'm gonna tell her, you know, that that's gotta go. And I mean, that still small voice said, no, you don't tell her nothing. She's not ready for that yet. When, she, when the time is right, I'll tell her that it's wrong. And you see, sometimes we want to fix everybody. And they don't even comprehend there's anything wrong. I invite you to join me in the Joyce Meyer app or at JoyceMeyer.org. Today, for more on this topic and other teachings, I believe God will use these to help you in your everyday life. I'll look forward to seeing you there.